Thank you. Hello, everybody. Sorry for the, for the little delay. And thanks to the uh, video guys who sorted out the problem uh, very quickly. So uh, we are here to spend some time to talk about uh, concurrency. I, uh, I titled the talk from Renable and Synchronized uh, to Parallel and Atomically. Renable and Synchronized, it's an old story, I guess. All of you have already heard that name. It's JDK Wong. Parallel anatomically, uh, parallel we don't have it yet. It's part of the JDK 8. Atomically we already have it, but it's not part of the JDK. JDK 1, it's 1995, almost 20 years ago. That's quite a lot. JDK 8 should arrive around uh, September 2013. What I would like to do with you is uh, not, not some kind of historical catalog. It would be really boring to, to do that but merely to, to put things into perspective, you see, uh, to understand where we were uh, 20 years ago and to understand uh, the different steps uh, through, um, through well, the, the history of things and uh, where we are going to go uh, in the next uh, few years. I am uh, José Pomar. I'm an assistant professor in the University of Paris 13. I've made a PhD in uh, applied math and computer science uh, quite a long time ago. Uh, I'm also an open source developer in the, in the Java uh, ecosystem, and I work uh, also as an independent. This is the first, uh, I can't really say computer, <laughs> calculator I've ever, I've ever pro programmed. Uh, it was in 1980. Uh, it doesn't work anymore. And this is the first computer uh, I programmed. This was a computer because it had uh, 16 kilobytes of memory, which was at that time uh, a lot. It was not really black and white. In fact, it was black and green because at that time black and white didn't exist. And you could program it in assembly and, uh, and basic. The, this calculator, I, 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 I showed it because I bought it like uh, 20, 25 years ago, maybe, uh, well, maybe 30 years ago. And in fact, it, it still works. It, it's a pity it's in my, in my bag. I, I could have shown you. Uh, but uh, this electronic device from Hewlett Packard uh, is, still, is still a working device, which is uh, amazing to me. Uh, I began to, to write programs in, uh, in C language around in the early uh, 90s and Java language uh, nearly as soon as uh, it was launched in 1996. Here's the, the name of the open source project I work on, Open Melody. You can check that if you wish. I also have a blog, uh, which is in French, I'm sorry, <laughs> and a Twitter account that you can follow. Uh, people don't get flooded by me uh, if they follow my account, so you can do that. I'm also a member of uh, the Paris uh, Java User Group, and uh, we organized last year a French edition of DevOx. It was a big success, and uh, I think we're going to organize another edition uh, next year. So concurrent programming, what is it about? Well, the answer is very simple, and you can just tell it in one simple sentence. It's about leveraging the computing power of recent CPUs, and that's all. And it's probably the only way to do that, as we're going to see uh, in the next minutes. So it raises three questions. First, what is this computing power made of? And this is the first question I would like to ask and, and to give answers uh, to. And what are the consequences of this, uh, this structure on the code I write as a Java developer? So we are going to talk about multi-core multi architectures from the hardware point of view. And what new issues, again as a Java developer, uh, does the parallel programming will raise to me? Because there are new problems, new solutions, and also new issues and new, new bugs, of course. We are going to talk about two main, two big categories of solution. For the first solution is about synchronization. But we are not going to talk only about synchronization. Uh, I would like to, to give um, hints about uh, software transactional memories and actors, and also to talk about immutable objects and structures. And then, what, are the going, uh, what, what new APIs will I be able to play with to build my parallel applications? Well, we are going to see that in GDK 7 with a fork join and parallel arrays. It's not, not really part of the GDK, GDK 7 but still, and uh, we're going to talk about JDK 8, the map, map filter reduced lambda and parallel. 
And I would like to also to, to talk about algorithm, because algorithm is going to play a central role in the developing of a future application. Because going parallel to, with an algorithm is just, not just a matter of dividing uh, tasks, uh, as it is possible to do it in a fork joint pattern, in a fork joint framework, but it, it, is, it, is going to, it, it is a matter of, of working with the algorithm as, at, at it, its deepest core. So is it possible to parallelize an algorithm? This is a very important question. Is it reliable? Will it lead to faster computations? That's not an obvious answer. And is it, is it, will, will it lead me to compute the same results as if I don't go parallel? So let's talk first about multi-threading. <coughs> Back in 1995, processors were quite simple. A multi-threading was merely a matter of dividing the timeline in slices. A microchip was only able to do one thing at a time. Couldn't do two things, it's not the case anymore. So basically, I've got an object, well, a structure, called a thread scheduler, that will divide this time among the threads that are asking for computing power. So sometimes T1 begins to work, at a certain time T1 begins to work. Then the thread scheduler decides that uh, T1 has enough of his, uh, of his um, processing power share, so it gives the hand, the hand to uh, T2, then to T3, and so on and so forth. In 1995, things are not happening in parallel on the processor. What would a thread, uh, would, wh why would the thread be suspended? Well, there are three reasons to suspend a thread. The first, the first one is that the thread scheduler has to share the, the computing power evenly among all the threads. So maybe, uh, on my previous example, uh, T1 had enough time to, 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 uh, to do its work, so the thread scheduler decided to suspend it. But the other, uh, there are two other reasons. For the first one is that the thread is waiting for, for a resource that is slow. At that time, the network is slow. The disk, the disk is slow, but the memory is not slow. The memory is a fast resource. It's not the case anymore now. And maybe a special operation uh, is being conducted on the CPU, and the thread has to wait for another thread to conduct this operation. It's, it's basically it's synchronization. <coughs> At that time, what, what do we call parallel computing? It has nothing to do with what, what we call parallel computing now. First, the, the 1995 is the end of the, of, the, of the reign of what we call SIMD architecture, and this is what I'm, I'm going to talk in, in the next few minutes. So this architecture deals with first with code and then with data. Right? On, on our computers, the code and data share the same memories, but it has not been the case or the case. So on, on those computers, the code uh, lives in its own memory. I've got a bunch of arithmetic and logic uh, units let's call that CPUs, I can, I can have uh, thousands, hundreds, or, or thousands of them. All these ALU are playing the same assembly code at the same moment. This is, this is what is, is called single instruction. And they are all sharing the same bank of memory, but they are all seeing a different zone of that memory. It's called data. And this is, leads to very fast architectures. Why? Because you don't have to move data from one CPU to the other or from one core to the other, as well we are going to see it's the case in multi-core uh, architecture. So this is the SIMD uh, architecture. There are quite a, a, um, a popular uh, machine built on this architecture. A Cray, by the way, is still a, still a brand. It's not a company anymore, but it's still a brand, so uh, this architecture is still used. And this architecture is used in a, in a JPU. What do I have in my toolbox uh, in 1995 to program a concurrent application? Well, I've, I don't have many things. I've got the thread class, the runnable interface. The, those are not compatible with the P thread, which is a standard in C++ and C and C++. Why is it not? Because, uh, because the thread and runnable have been written before the P thread uh, was out. I've got the difference between green threads and native threads. I'm not going too much into the details. And every Java object has what is called a monitor. And this leads to the, to the, the very important notion, synchronized and volatile. And this will stay like this until 2004. And this is nearly 10 years. I mean, 10 years is so long in, in computer science. 
<clears throat> in 2004-2005, this is a revolution, a real revolution, both on the software front and on the hardware front. First, this is the first appearance of multi-core processors in the, uh, let's say, general public uh, computers. And this period of time is called the end of free meal by uh, several uh, Java specialists. What does it mean? It means that to get more computing power, you cannot rely anymore on the increase of the frequency of the processors. Uh, the clock speed of the microchips have, have reached a max. It means that the, the, only, the only quality you needed in, uh, in 1995 or until uh, 2004 uh, for an application to run faster, the only quality needed was patience. If your application is too slow, wait two years, get a new computer, and it will run two, two times or four times faster. Since 2005, it is not the case anymore. You have to be smart. You can be patient, but it is no use. You have to be smart, and it's much more difficult to be smart than to be patient. You can believe me. <laughs> Okay, in 2007, uh, in, sorry, in 2007, yes, it's also uh, the introduction of new APIs that enable a Java application or another application, of course, to, um, to use the, the, the phenomenous uh, computing power available in the GPU. So right now, what, what is the situation? Well, in any kind of smartphone or tablet, you have processor with one to four cores. On a normal PC, you have four, eight, 16 cores. On a professional server, you, have, you can have 128. Tomorrow, in the, in the next years to come, uh, research lab are already working on clusters of million nodes, each node counting 10,000 cores. That makes billions of cores. Nobody knows how to program those architectures yet. It will need some kind of brain work to be able to do that. On the software side, it's the release of Java 5. And with Java 5 uh, comes a very smart piece of, uh, of software called the, called the Java Util Concurrent uh, package. Uh, this package is available from uh, Java 5 uh, and now on. Uh, you can also use it. Uh, I know that many people are still, are still working with Java 4. So you can also use this package in Java 4. In fact, you have two solutions for that. There's a package named edu.oswego and there's a backport of Java 5. So there are two solutions. And Java 5 is a real revolution on, on the, well, the Java Util Concurrent is the real revolution on that side. It's new classes, new interfaces, but also new um, uh, concepts introduced in the, in the JDK. There is an excellent book written by Brian Good, by the way. If you haven't read it, maybe, maybe you could. It's one of the, of the, best, book, uh, of the best book in, uh, in Java I have uh, ever read, personally. So what are the main issues uh, with multi-threadings? Multi-threading, sorry. Well, the first one is that you can't avoid it. <laughs> Just for the reason I told you. If you, if you try to avoid multi-threading, you, your application will, that is slow today will also be slow tomorrow. The second main issue is called the data race. What is the data race? It's very simple, the two threads that are reading and modifying the same variable at the same time. And we're going to see that this notion of the same time is really central if you want to understand concurrency. Let's talk a classical example, the singleton pattern. I guess that everybody knows that pattern here. Everybody knows that this pattern written like that is not thread safe. Uh, let's suppose the two threads are, are um, uh, running this piece of code uh, concurrently, so the thread one is running. First it tests if instance is null, and so is yes, so it enters the if block. And then comes the thread scheduler. Stop thread T1, give the hand to thread T2. T2 is uh, beginning to run, test if instance is null. Well, instance is, st is still null, in fact. So it enters the if block. And now both threads, T1 and T2, are in the if block, and they'll both be able to, con to build uh, the singleton object. So I'll end up with a singleton with two instances. It's not really singleton anymore, is it? <laughs> I guess not. So we need to prevent interruption right here with the arrow. 
So how can I do that? Well, I can uh, very easily synchronize the get instance uh, method. It's the easiest way to do that. Okay, what consequences has it? Suppose I have three threads, T1, T2, T3. One of them is going to win and to be able to enter the synchronized method. Let's suppose it's T3. What happens on the single call? Well, T3 is working, entering the synchronized block, taking the monitor, beginning to, to build a single town, making the test. And then the thread scheduler decides to, to stop that thread. Let's suppose that. So it gives the hands to thread T2. T2 arrives at the, the entrance of the synchronized block, tries to take the monitor, but it can't because T1 has it. Then the thread, we are on a monocore system, so the thread scheduler knows that uh, nothing will ever release that, that block because, because on a monocore you can't do two things at the same time. So it suspends the thread C2, put it on the wait list, and gives the hand to thread T1. And the same thing happened to T1. Okay, so T2 or T1 are in the wait list. The, um, the thread scheduler decides to give the hand back to T3. T3 continues its work. Its work. Um, ends up building the, this instance, gives back the monitor, then the thread scheduler will eventually uh, suspend it, give the hand to a T1 that will read the object and T2 that will read it too. This is what happens on a single core. Synchronization is not, not a big issue on a single core. What happens on a multi-core now? It happens much different thing. T3 is running, entering the synchronized block, taking the monitor, begin to, to build the, the instance, but on the other call there are things that are happening. Okay, so T2 is begin, beginning to work, reaches the entrance of the synchronized block. It can't, it can't enter that synchronized block because it doesn't have the monitor, the monitor is not available. So what happens, the, the thread scheduler knows that may, maybe on the other call, uh, T1 is T3 is running, maybe the, the lock will be released, and as there is an overhead to, to remove T2 from the, from the core and to bring another thread on it, it decides to, to, to wait for a little moment, for a few, a few a little time, to see, the monitor, so to see the monitor is eventually released. It's not, then it removes the T2 from the, from the core and installs T1 on in it. And then the same thing happens again. Okay, T1 will wait for the monitor, the monitor is not available, so there's a little time out here and eventually T1 will be removed from the, from, the, from the core. T3 is still running on the other core and will release the monitor at, after, a certain time, uh, after a certain time. But during that time, everything is blocked and eventually the other core will have nothing to do. T3 released the block, the thread scheduler decides that T3 uh, worked enough. So it gives the hand to T2 that now can take the monitor and is going to enter the block of code and run it. T3, T2 is not going to modify the instance. It will only read that instance, take it, and take it back. But while T2 is doing that, T1 can't do it because, because it doesn't have the monitor and it needs the monitor to do that read. And it's a, it's a real waste of time because T1, T1 could, be, could be reading uh, th this instance at the same time as, uh, as T2 uh, concurrently. But it can't because this, the block is synchronized. So you see that the, the fact to the, the, the synchronization of this block is really uh, the, the singleton was, a, was even a pattern before multi-core architecture. But now that we have a, sorry monocore architecture, but now that we have multi-core architecture, this pattern is becoming a terrible anti-pattern. It is a, a, a point of contention that is really terrible that has really slowed down my application very much. So I don't want to do that. Before the multi-core, I could do that, but now that I have multi-core, I don't want to do that anymore. So what do I do? Well, it's a bit more complicated. Maybe I should go and see my architect. The guy doesn't, doesn't, um, doesn't write any code uh, anymore. He doesn't do that anymore because he's too old and too experimented. And he tells me, well, what we can do is instead of synchronizing, we can check if instance is null. And if it's not, we just, we just give it back so that we don't have any synchronization for the read. And if it's not that we, then we, we enter a synchronized block where, where we are going to, to check again if instance is null, of course, because we, are, we have the same problem here as the one we had previously. 
and build it in that instance in a synchronized block. And this is nice because in that, in that pattern, um, I can read without any synchronization, so without any contention, and the write will be still protected by a synchronization block. Okay, this pattern is not new. Maybe some of you already know it. It's called double check locking. And if I talk to you about double check locking, it's because it's broken. That pattern doesn't work. Okay, we are going to see the exact reason why this pattern doesn't work in a minute. So here is the first solution to the data race. I can synchronize the access to my variable, especially the writes. The drawback is that it will lead to contentions in my code. And those contentions are really a, a, big, a big deal. It, 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 it can hurt, it can hurt uh, performance very badly. So people have tried to find other solutions, and the first one is uh, maybe I could decide not to modify any of my variable. And this will lead to immutable system. I can do that. I can do that in immutable systems, and immutable systems uh, work. But I can, I, I, I can also ask myself, I have I to use variables? What about if I, if I decide not to use any variables? Is it possible? Is it even possible? Answer is yes, and it's the basic of functional programming. Functional programming is not supposed to use any variables. Let's talk a bit more about synchronization. Uh, we are very uh, lucky, uh, Java developers, because we have a document called the Java Language Specification, which is a, a huge book, about 600 pages, a bit, bit hard to read, but it's the specification of all the language and part of this API. And in, in this um, book, in this specification, there's a chapter about the Java memory model. So what the Java memory model is about? It's about defining the value of a variable at a given moment. Okay. And it says, reading a variable should return the last value written in this variable. And really, when I read that, do I really need to write 600 pages of a very uh, hard to read technical book just to say that reading a variable should return the last value written in this variable just before? Once again, the time is the key here. The most important word in this sentence is the word last. When I've got only one thread, I don't have any problem with that. I write a variable, I write a value somewhere, read it from that place, and it's the same. When I'm on a, on a multi-thread architecture on one call, <coughs> it's not really a problem in, in, to me uh, neither. It's a problem for people who are writing compilers, writing the JVM, because when you do that, um, well, th this, this sentence is merely a constraint on the, on the, the way the compiler will work, because compilers uh, have a bad tendency to reorder the things I write uh, in my code. But when I'm multi-thread and multi-core, that is a real problem. Why? Because when I'm, when I'm working on a core, I absolutely have no information of what is happening on the core next to me. I might know what is happening on the general, but the exact operation that has been conducted, really I don't know, and I can't know it. Does it apply all the time? The answer is no, because it would be too expensive, as we're going to see. So I need to declare explicitly that this rule will hold for a given variable. And we're going to see how we can do that. How does it work? From a theoretical, theoretical point of view, it works with the dependency graph. All right, I know that no one likes graphs, but hey, we need one here. Um, the graph is a, is a dependency graph between reads operation and writes uh, operation. So here's a, a very simple graph, two nodes, no vertex. X equal one, R one equal X, uh, um, R one equal X. If I build a dependency link between those two operations, it will mean that R one equal X will have to read one, the value that I put in X just before. This link is described in the JLS. It's called the happens before link. 
If this link exists, that means that x, x equal 1 will happen before r1 equal x. Well, that's simple. If this link doesn't exist, then the value of R1 after those two operations have been made is not defined, especially if I'm on a multi-threaded environment. Okay, so I'm happy that to know that this link exists. Now I can, how can I create such a link? Well, there is a rule for that. I can't, I, I'm not going to declare, you know, nobody ever saw a happens before link declaration in a Java code. But the JLS states that such a link exists between every synchronized and volatile write and the following synchronized and volatile reads that happens. So the, in this case, the read will see the preceding write and this leads to the notion of visibility. Let's take an example. I've got a very simple class, an incrementation and a, and a testing. Such a class is not thread safe, as you all know. Those two reads and writes are no volatile, no synchronized, so there's no visibility between those two operations. If one thread increments index, the other thread will test the value of index, but maybe it will never see any change in the value of index. If I change index to a volatile variable, then the reads be uh, become uh, volatile reads, and the writes become volatile writes. So there, there is a visibility. And every time I, in, I increment index, if I test it, even if it's, if it's on, on, in another thread and on another the core, then the, the value of index will be seen by the other thread. There are, there are still some um, problematic cases, and here is one, which is uh, an example uh, from, the, from the JLS, from the Java language specification. I've got two methods with two writes and uh, two reads. Suppose T1 is the first thread to take the lock of uh, the synchronized block. So the first operation that will happen is x equal 1. Second operation is y equal 1. Okay. Since y equal 1 happens before a1 equal y, the operation 3 and 4 are those, and the value of r1 or r2 are both 1. Now suppose that the second thread, T2, takes the log first. All the information I have is that R1 equal Y will happen before Y equal 1. But what happened to X equal 1 and R2 equal X? I have no information on that. Absolutely no information, so either, one, either, either of these operations can happen before the other one. So what is the, the value of R1 is 0, okay, that's fine. But what is, what is the value of R2? This I don't know. And it's a bit problematic to have a code that is not causal, uh, as you may know. And this is the exact problem I have with the double check locking. Double check locking, the read on the instance is a normal read. This read is a synchronized read, and this write is a synchronized write. So I don't have any happen before link between the first read and the two others. So I can have an instance that is seen null before the synchronized and is, that is not seen null just after the synchronized. And this I can't, I can't really uh, um, know uh, if this is going to happen or not. And it's even worse than that. Since there are absolutely no synchronization on the on the first read, I can even see the, the pointer to the singleton while this singleton is being constructed by the JVM because I don't have any synchronized. So this is the reason why uh, the double check locking is a broken pattern. Okay, so what is the good pattern to build a singleton? Well, we could go, we could go volatile on a singleton instance and this will lead to really very simple singleton class, as you can see. <laughs> one volatile, one synchronized, okay. Uh, if, if you do that, the performance will be roughly the same as uh, to put a synchronized on the, on the get instance method directly. But there's another solution, which is this one, uh, given to us by George Brosh uh, in the blog. Just take an enumeration and you'll have a very nice singleton and exchange one line of code for 15 line of codes. 
Thanks to George Bosch to, for written such a, a good book, <laughs> Effective Java, and uh, for giving us uh, this pattern. So let's talk uh, about the microprocessor, which is still at the core of uh, every computer we have. I'm going to talk about uh, the Nealem architecture, a very simplified version of uh, this architecture, which is the, ar the, the architecture at the core of uh, Intel i3, i5, and i7. And I'll, I'm going to focus on the four core architecture. So this is, these are the four cores of, uh, of an LM, to be simplified, as you can see it. Those cores are associated with uh, caches. There are three levels of caches, L1 and L2. Each L1 and L2 cache is, um, is, is linked to a given core, and there is a, a common cache called uh, L3, which is linked to all the three cores at the same time. The, L, the, the L1 cache is organized in two parts. There are 32 kilobytes of uh, memory for instructions and 32 kilobytes of memory devoted to data. L2 is 256 kilobytes of data, and L3, the shared cache, is 8 megabytes of, of, uh, of data. Not all the 8 megabytes are available for caching because, in fact, L2, L1 and L2 are copied in, uh, into L3 for uh, uh, performance reasons. Let's take a very simple example, uh, an incrementation in a synchronized block. And let's suppose that I've got three threads, T1, T2, and T3, that are trying to execute this piece of code at the same time. Okay, T3 is going to win. So T1, T2, and T3 are going to be installed on uh, each uh, core. The value of index will be copied in each cache. Well, the value is 10. And T3 is going to execute the incrementation, so the value of index will go from 10 to uh, 11. And this is in a synchronized block, so it is a synchronized write. So T1 and T2 have to see this modification. So this visibility has an impact. There is some kind of information that must go to from the core C3 to C1 and C2 to, to tell them, well, the, the value you have is not 10 anymore, now it's 11. This is the impact of the visibility that we just saw uh, on the pure software point of view. So this is conducted by the use of a special assembly instruction called the memory barrier. Okay, so the memory barrier is just an assembly instruction that is put by the, by the JVM, by the, by the write code. And this instruction will invalidate the L1 cache for the index variable in both uh, C1 and C2 calls where the T1 and T2 threads are running. So when T1 and T2 are going to read their variable, they won't be able to read it from L1. They'll have to read it from L3 because it is the shared uh, cache between all the calls in, in that processor. So what is the price of that? Because of course there's a price. Um, well, the, um, the cost to read a variable in uh, the L1 cache, the, the cache sorry, is one nanosecond. It's full cycle of processor, never mind. The cost to read a variable in the L2 cache is 3 nanoseconds. And the cost to read in the L3 cache is 15 nanoseconds. That's 15 times as much as the one to read in L1. That's really too bad that I have to go back to L3 to, 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 do, to conduct this read. If I'm on a multiprocessor uh, motherboard architecture, this is even worse because uh, to, to, to communicate from one uh, socket to another, I need to go through that quick pass interconnection, uh, whatever, and the reading time is 20 nanoseconds. And if I must go to the RAM, it's 80 nanoseconds. Really a very long time. I told you at the beginning of that talk that the RAM was a, a fast resource uh, 20 years ago, but it's not the case anymore. And now you can see it. So it has a cost. But this organization of cache of caches in the, in the processor will lead me to a first optimization. If I can write a code that can be held in 32 kilobytes of memory and that works on data that is 32 kilobytes too and no memory barrier, then I can run really fast. 
I can run at one gigahertz, which is really the, the, the fastest speed I, I, can, I can get from a processor. Uh, maybe, maybe 32 kilobytes I, is not a lot for you, but uh, not such a long time ago, 32 kilobytes was the, the, the old amount of memory you, had, you would have in a, in a single computer, like this one. But there's more. The L3 cache in organized, is organized in lines. Each line begins with a, a status flag. And then each, each line can hold eight longs, Java longs. So 64 uh, bytes. So in one RAM access, 80 nanoseconds, I, I, in fact, I take back, I, I, I come back with eight longs loaded every time. So this will lead to a second optimization. If my data, if I, if I, if my data can be held in contiguous memory spaces, then, lo then loading them in the cache will be eight times faster as if it's not the case. So what should I, do? What, what should I use? A redist or linked list? <laughs> in an array list, I have an array, okay? In a linked list, my objects are uh, scattered randomly in the memory. So maybe loading a, an array list uh, in a cache will be eight times faster than loading a linked list. Okay, so the cache is organized in lines, that's fine, but there is a trap in that organization. And I'll go, I'm going to, to, show you, to show that to you on, um, on an example. Let's take an example of two threads, T1 and T2. T1 uses a variable A and T2 uses a variable B. Both variables are volatile, but they are not shared between T1 and T2. There's no sharing whatsoever. And for some reason, A and B are in the same cache line. So in L3, I've got A and B. T1 is on call C1, T2 on call C2. So T1 needs A. So A will be copied from uh, L3 to uh, uh, L1 cache of C1. And T2 needs B, so B is going to be copied in the, in the L1 cache of, um, of T2. But since everything uh, is transferred line by line, A will come with B and B will come with A. Now suppose T1 is working on A and just increments it. Okay, A, A plus one. So there's an information that will go to L3 since A is a volatile variable. And this, is, this information is just, well, A has been modified by C1. Okay, so L3 see that C2 has also a copy of A, so it will tell C2 that, hey, have a look, you have A, but it's not A anymore. So it will invalidate that cache line. And that's really bad luck because B is also on that cache line. So what is going to happen when C2 wants to read B? Well, a cache maze will occur. That's too bad because C2 doesn't, doesn't, has nothing to do with A. C2 only, only wants to work with B. But it has to go and read B from cache L3 just because there is a mechanism called false sharing. This, this is the false sharing. It's, a, it's completely invisible from the, the, the developer point of view because my code is completely clean. Okay, I've got volatile variables. They are, they are not shared between T1 and T2. So there's absolutely nothing I can do against that. So what's the solution? Well, people have, have, have searched and uh, they found a solution called variable padding. <coughs> And I talk me about clean code. The variable padding is, uh, I'm going to show you two examples. Uh, one from the LMAX disruptor, which is a very a smart uh, framework um, developed by uh, the LMAX company. And the other one is from the, the GDK itself. So in the LMAX code, there is this piece of code in a class named sequence. Um, it's an open source code. You can download it from Google code and uh, it has moved it to, to GitHub. Uh, a few, few months ago. At the center of it, here, you have this value. Value is an index on a, on a ring buffer, and the ring buffer is at the core of, the, of, the, of their framework, so okay. I'm not going to go deeper into the details, but the idea is to say, okay, I've got this value here. I'm going to put eight, seven longs on the right of this value and seven longs on the left of this value. 
And if I do that, I am sure that value is, will be alone on its own line of, of, uh, of, of cash. And this is the only reason why uh, all these dummy values have been created in this, uh, in this class. Second example, in the thread local random uh, class from the JDK, uh, version 7, you have the exact same trick that is used, and it's a piece of code that's, that has been written by uh, Dougley himself. So I think that it's, uh, we, we can say we can use this, this piece of code. <coughs> the, 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 really, the real answer, uh, the, the real question uh, it, it raises is that uh, when I write this kind of code, I have to take into account the structure of the microprocessor. Is it really what I want to do? Of course not. But if I do so, I can hugely optimize my code greatly increase, dramatically increase the performance, and it leads, of course, to tricky uh, stuff to use. And those tricks will make my code machine dependent, and this is completely orthogonal with, with the idea, with the, the, the most deepest idea of, of the Java development. I mean, Java is about writing once and running everywhere. So it leads to a question, is Java really, really ready to, to leverage the, the power of those microprocessors because I don't want to write machine-dependent code. And the answer is probably not, but not yet. I heard that Dougley himself is uh, working on, uh, on a part of the JVM that would uh, detect those faults sharing and uh, be able to avoid it automatically. And it would, it, it, it would be good to have that, of course. Let's talk about uh, the Java Util Concurrent, this, this piece of, of uh, software uh, that has been, uh, that, that arrived with Java 5. Java Util Concurrent is a real evolution uh, as far as uh, writing concurrent code is, uh, is concerned. First, it's a new pattern to create threads, and this is really important. The only way I had to create thread in Java, from Java 1 to Java 4, was this one, to implement Renable, to give this subject uh, to, to, a new, to a new thread and to start that thread. First, this method run doesn't return any value. And second, it doesn't throw any exception, doesn't raise any exception. And this is a pity because it's basically the only two ways I have to, to communicate a result to a calling method, returning a value and throwing an exception. Third, it, 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 it um, implies the creation of a new thread uh, every time it is called. And this is also a pity because a thread, especially in 1995, a thread is a, is a system resource. So creating one and releasing one all the time uh, has an overhead. In the JDK 5 way, uh, the runnable uh, interface has been replaced. Well, it has not been replaced, but I, I've got this new interface called callable. Callable exposes a method called call. And this method throws an exception and returns a value. So now I can have a clean way to uh, communicate the result of, uh, of a computation conducted in a separate thread. And well, I have this future uh, class too um, that, that enable communication between, between threads. And this future class also can be called with a get and it can be called with a timeout. So if a thread is stuck because of a resource that is down or whatever, I can use this, um, this future to say, okay, in, in uh, 100 milliseconds, I want the result, and if I don't have it, okay, never mind, I'm going to do something else. It also comes with new synchronization patterns. In Java 5, the, old, the, the, the only synchronization patterns I have is one for atomicity, with the synchronized stuff, and one for visibility, with the volatile stuff. Now I've got a log interface, with one method unlock that I should call in the final, finally block to be sure the lock is released. Of course, if it's not released, uh, I may come into a problem. <coughs> I've got this lock method that exists, in fact, in two versions, lock and try lock that takes a timeout. This is something I couldn't do with a synchronized block. I've got the CIMA4 interface. It's merely the same kind of thing that, that the, the, lock, uh, the lock interface. Uh, I've got this acquire uh, method 
on the try acquire method. The difference between a lock and a semaphore is that a lock can only uh, give access to one thread at a time to the guarded uh, block of code, uh, while the semaphore can give access to, uh, in this example, five threads uh, at a time. So I can, uh, I can, um, I have the hand uh, on that. I also have uh, other methods on the semaphore that will allow me to to check if there are many threads waiting. Uh, for the, to execute the, the block of code that, uh, that has been guarded. I've got the countdown latch class, which is a very uh, useful, especially in uh, initialization. A countdown is a, basically a, la uh, a countdown. Uh, it counts from, uh, let's say, three. Well, here in, in, in this example, it's only one, but it can count down from a given uh, number. And it, every time I, I uh, call the countdown uh, method, the index is decreased, and all the methods that have that have called the await method uh, will be released when the the counter uh, reaches uh, zero. The cyclic barrier uh, class is another way of synchronizing thing. It it works um, in in a comparable way as as the as the countdown, but the, the countdown you can't reset it. A barrier you can. So every time you call uh, a wait, there's a, a counter that is decreased. And if you, if you have uh, initialized your barrier with, let's say, well, it's two in this example, it means that two await calls uh, will release the barrier, will open the barrier. And once again, you also have um, the, the, same, the same method with, uh, with the possibility of a, of a timeout. And I have this uh, read-write lock uh, interface, which could be used in, the, in a singleton pattern because it's the exact problem uh, we talked uh, about a few minutes ago. The read-write lock interface uh, handles pairs of lock. There's a write lock and that's a read lock. Here's the pattern. Uh, the idea is the following. Uh, when I write, I must be the one and the only one to write and the one is able to read. But all the reads are free and uh, they can happen concurrently. So this is the, the, the exact thing I, I would like to do when I, um, when I um, deal with a singleton pattern. But once again, the enumeration is much more simple, so <laughs> let's use it. I have a new notion, which is uh, very interesting because it's very close to the assembly code, called the atomic types. Atomic types come in different flavor. You have atomic longs, floats, references, Etc. Here's the, 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 the pattern with the atomic integer. Uh, the atomic integer exposes a certain number of methods. Increment and gate is one of them. And this incrementation and return of the value is supposed to happen atomically. And what's nice with this uh, instruction is that it compiles in a single assembly instruction. The assembly instruction uh, has been made and the Java language has taken it to expose it as a, as a, a class, a set of classes and methods. How does, it, how does it work? It works on the compare and swap casing, called casing, um, principle. The assembly uh, code takes three parameters. The first one is a memory address. The second one is a, an expected value. And the third one is a new value. I'm going to read that memory address, and if the value that is written at that memory address is the expected value, then I'm going to change it atomically. And if it's not the case, then I'll do it again. Well, then I'll return false, and in a Java code, I'll do it again, in fact. There's no synchronization at all in this stuff. So it's very in interesting and very efficient to implement counters if, uh, if you need it. What is the code for this increment and get? This code is from the Java, uh, from the JDK, sorry. It's an infinite loop. I read the address in the current variable. I increment it. And I use this compare and set method, which is in fact an assembly, an, an assembly instruction. And if, it's, uh, and if it um, returns true, then it means that I could do the modification and then I, I return next. And if it doesn't, I do it, I do it again. So there's no miracle here. If there is a high contention or high concurrency on that precise variable, then I will loop and loop and loop again until it, uh, I'm able to, uh, 
to, to increment the, uh, my counter. So it works very well if, if there's no, no, not too much uh, concurrency, which is a bit paradoxical, of course. <laughs> concurrency works well with them when there's no concurrency. <coughs> and you see that the, the way it works will be much different than the synchronization for, uh, stuff. On the, on the synchronization side, when I have a very high contention, I've got all the threads waiting to enter the synchronized block. So basically, there's only one thread working, so potentially no activity on the CPU. On the, on, with the atomic long on casing uh, approach, all the CPUs are working. They are incrementing, incrementing, and incrementing again. And at, at any time, there's only one that is going to, 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 to win the case, in fact. So, so the, the, the use of the CPU is absolutely not the same. And I have this very uh, smart piece of code called the blocking queues. The blocking queues is a, is a, is a queue, so it's a, it's a new concept. Well, it has uh, been introduced a bit earlier, but it's a, it's a new concept in the, in the collection framework. And it's an implementation that has been made especially, you can say that, for the consumer producer pattern. So what is a, what is a queue, basically? It's a, it's a structure. It's a, it, can, it could be a collection where I can add stuff remove stuff, and just watch the element that is available uh, on the waiting list. The implementation of blocking queue uh, states that the size of the queue may be bounded, which is not the case in the, in the collection or in, or in sets. So it means that adding an element can fail, and the blocking queue defines different types of failure, as we're going to see it. One can remove uh, an element, and, and uh, if, if the queue is empty, of course, removing an element will not be possible. So removing an element may fail, too, with different types of behavior also. And you can also check uh, the queue for the next available element, and this can also uh, fail. I've got three uh, behaviors possible if I want to add an element and I can't. The first is to block and to wait until there's a slot available. The second one is to return false, either immediately or with a timeout. We also already saw that uh, timeouts were everywhere in this, uh, in this API. And I can also uh, throw immediately an exception. Getting an element is exactly the same, with the three same behaviors. Blocking until a, a, variable, a value becomes available. Returning null, either immediately or uh, after a timeout or immediately throw uh, an exception. And examining is uh, the same as getting, um, immediately returning null or throwing an exception. This blocking queue is uh, at, the, at the heart of the, um, the fork joint pattern that we're going to see um, a bit later. So this is also the, the reason why we spend uh, some time on it. So these are the, the different uh, methods that are available, excuse me, that are available um, on, on, this, uh, on this interface. And this leads to uh, immutable structures. It is the last structure that uh, is made available in the, um, in the, in the Java Util correction, uh, sorry, Java Util concurrent API, with the copy and write array list. It leads to a, to a new kind of, uh, to a new way of uh, writing code, the, the immutable approach that we're going to see in more details. So what is a copy uh, on write array list? Basically it's a, an array, and I decide that this array is immutable, so I can't, I can't change it. And since I can't change it, I mean, this is very nice because I, I don't need any kind of synchronization to, to read it. I'm sure si since the, its value has been fixed forever, I can, I can use it all the time, and it is really perfect for me. Okay, so since it is immutable, and since I can change it, how can I change it? <laughs> it's the first question that, of course, every, every, every child will ask <laughs> when you want to, and, uh, to prevent him from doing something. Okay, how can I do it? <laughs> okay, so this is an array. I've got a pointer on it called tab. And it's immutable. So reads don't need to be synchronized. It's very fast. I can share it. I can copy it everywhere. Never, never it, it, will be, it will be modified. Now suppose I want to change this element. 
How can I do that? Well, since I can't change it, first I have to make a copy of it. I'm in a thread, I want to modify the value of this array. So first I make a copy of this value. And this copy only implies a read on this array. So it's not a synchronized piece of code. I am the only thread that owns that copy. So since that I'm, I'm the only thread that owns that copy, I can freely modify it because it's not shared. No synchronization again. So I modify it. And then I need to update the pointer to my array. And this operation is synchronized. But it's only the, the movement, the, the moving of a pointer from a, from a place to another. It's a very short operation and a very cheap operation. This synchronization is not, is not a big contention in my code. From a given point of view, this array will never change. All the threads that are reading the array will not see the change of the pointer. So they will continue to read the, the old version of the array. And the, 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 new, the new thread that are going to, to, to ask for the new pointers will have the new version of the array. So eventually, in the end, uh, nobody will have any pointer again on this, old, uh, on, on this array. And this array will be, will be garbaged by the garbage collector. So this leads to a new kind of, of approach, this immutable structure. If I can do that on an array, it means that I can imagine an array list, well, a list, collection, and list, that is immutable. And if I check the collection framework, what do I have in the collection framework? I have arrays, I have linked list, and I have hash tables, and that's all. That's all the implementation of the t uh, classical uh, collection framework. So will I be able to build, for instance, immutable hash tables? And will they be uh, efficient from an implementation point of view? Because this immutable array is not very efficient. I have to system array copy uh, it all the time. So it works well when I have many reads and not too many writes. But could I be able to do the same with hash tables? Well, the answer is yes. And this is fortunate. And um, well, maybe we could have a cup of coffee before going any further. Would you agree on that? Yes? Is it a good time to do that? Yeah? yeah? OK. <laughs> so we'll learn about immutable hash table after a little cup of coffee. Thank you. <laughs>